Hello, everyone, and welcome back to uh, Art and Wild. This is the first real episode, kind of. Uh, the last one I did was the introduction episode, but this is kind of the first real uh, interview that I have. And today I'm interviewing Matt Poole. Um, Matt Poole is a wildlife photographer based out of the Pacific Northwest, and I'll let him introduce himself a little more. Hey, everyone. Um, I'm Matt Poole. I'm a 20-year-old wildlife photographer based out of Oregon. Um, I have been doing wildlife photography for roughly eight years. Um, it's hard to you know pinpoint whenever, but um, I'm also a conservationist and um, love working with animals and yeah. I didn't know you've been shooting for almost eight years. I think we have the exact same story pretty much. Yeah, I think it, I think I was 12 when I started. Same. I was 12 or 11. Once again, it's hard to pin down, you know, exactly. It is, was, right? It's in, Yeah. In the first episode, I was talking about like how I started and it was kind of gradual. Like I started taking pictures with my phone, but around 11 or 12 is when I got into it. Now, today we're going to be talking about owl photography primarily because Matt does a lot of awesome work with owls. Uh, but first I have some like general just discussion topics because you just got the Z9 recently, right? Yes, I did. You yeah. did? That's awesome. I have the photo. Hunt shit. Shout out to Hunt's Photo and Video and Gary and Noah. Definitely. Yeah. Um, if you don't know what uh what Hunt's Photos is, it's a camera company out on the East Coast. You should definitely look into it. They're awesome. But how are you liking the Z9? Because I just got it recently too, and I want to see your thoughts on it. Yeah. So I was using the D850 before, um, which is uh, a digital camera. So stepping up into the mirrorless game is like it's a whole new world. Yeah. Um, definitely some um transition time it, it uh I needed um to make that switch but right now i'm loving it um my favorite part it's got to be an electronic viewfinder which we've talked about before mm -hmm. and like yeah. the non blackout is so nice and just always having your eye on the subject um the autofocus is great um eye tracking the animal uh, modes are just mm -hmm. phenomenal i'm just yeah. loving every second of it second of it yeah, the electronic viewfinder was definitely the big jump for me because I was shooting with the Nikon D500, which is, you know, it's a good, it was a good camera. I mean, you were shooting with the D850, which is like, you know, really good. Um, I love my D500, but like switching over to the Z9 was like a huge game changer, you know, it yeah. was like, and the electronic viewfinder was definitely the big, because I haven't missed an exposure on a shot in like four months. No, yeah, I haven't either. It's so no. nice. You know, because like before with the D500 and I'd assume the same problem with the D850, like, oh, a coyote runs in front of you and you're like, oh, I got to get a shot of that. And then you take the shot. And you're like, great. And then you look at the image and it's like the night before you're on like one eighth of a second and ISO yeah. like 10,000 and the shots all white, you know? Um, yeah. And that's not an issue with the, the, the you know, with the electronic viewfinder. Yeah. And then you got the 100 to 400, right? Yes, I did get that. Shout out to Hunts again. Once again. Um, yep. Yeah, so before I had the 500 uh, millimeter f4 that Nikon mm -hmm. made, it was the the G. So it's like I want to say 16 years old. Yeah, um, heavy, heavy lens, but um, <laughs> really love that camera. It's sharp, it's fast. Yeah, uh, but the 100 to 400, especially nowadays where I'm more going into environmental shots and mm -hmm. trying to get wider and wider uh, with my subjects, showing more of the environment creating new compositions, um, trying to be more unique with my uh, photography. The yeah. 100 to 400 hundreds definitely uh, helped me out a lot. Yeah, you know, I, so I went, I've been shooting with the Zoom like my entire time doing wildlife photography. I, I pretty much the Sigma 150 to 600 was like my go-to automatically, you know, um, that's why I always shot, but I just recently got the 500 PF, shout out to Hunts again. Um, but you know, I, it's weird. I really like it. I love it. It's sharp. It's awesome. But I'm getting adjusted to shooting with the prime because shooting with the zoom, as you said, you had a lot of options of what you want to do. Like if you have, you know, like, oh, this would look really good as a small and frame vertical and you can switch it to that. And the other day I haven't run into any major problems with it yet, but the other day I was shooting any Gret and it was like a really misty scene in my brain. I'm like, oh, I'm just going to zoom out. And then I went to zoom out and then it just didn't work. So we'll see warbler season's coming up and it's a yep. lot of like fast shooting. So I'm going to see if the, the zoom is causing an issue, but so far I am loving the lens. It's sharp. It's fast. It's amazing. Now, another thing I do want to talk about recently is so your account like blew up, I think yeah. sometime last year, like ridiculously. And if anyone doesn't follow Matt on Instagram, you should, but can you like, how many followers do you have now exactly on Instagram? 200,000 right now. That's and before insane. it blew up, I think I had like, I want to say 3,000. 
something like that. Yeah, I I remember yeah. when this went down because can you describe the reel that you posted on Instagram that kind of cost? Yeah, that? yeah. So um, I've been working with Burrowing Owls the past four years now. It's mm -hmm. pretty crazy. So in 2020, I started. I volunteered on a project in Northeastern Oregon, um, and the next year I was a intern, paid intern. And then the next year I led the project, oh, wow. but, um, it's just hands-on work with owls. Um, I always take videos of them cause they're so cute and I love to cherish the, cherish those memories. But, um, I just started posting those videos that I took, mm -hmm. uh, on, on Instagram and like TikTok. Um, this particular one was like a batch of, I want to say like eight baby owls. And it's just yeah. after they've been banded, um, coated in flea killing and repelling dust and like weighed. So they're all in this bucket and they're all ready to be shipped back into the, uh, their artificial burrow. So it's just one by one, me picking them up, setting them down and people loved it. I mean, it was, it was pretty they insane. They loved it, yeah. I posted it. I think I went to bed. I woke up the next morning and it had like, I think it was like 5 million views. And then within that day, it got up to like 20 million views. And then after that week, it was like 35 million views. So yeah, people love fluffy little animals. I don't blame them. Also, and it's weird because I had like family members that I don't let aren't invested in wildlife at all bring it up that video, yep. and then I saw like a repost of it the other day, and had this happened like a year ago, right? I think it happened last summer. Last um, summer, yeah, yeah, it was. July. I, I recently, a couple like a month ago, I saw another repost of that video. It's so oh, yeah. yeah. But yeah. like looking at that, I mean, going from 3,000 followers or like 6,000 followers, wherever you had before, to a platform of like 200,000 people, has that like approached the way, uh, has that changed how you approach using your platform in any way or? I I don't think so. Um, I don't want it to, honestly. Yeah. I just want it, um, I just want to have fun on the platform. I don't want to look at it as like, I don't want to cause unnecessary stress when I look at it. So yeah. it's just like, doing what I did, post my videos, just, you know, share my work yeah. and, and, you know, let people enjoy it. Yeah. I got you. Yeah. That's yeah. awesome. Now, you know, you've done work with burrowing owls. You've done all this photography with owls and you've gotten into the world of wildlife things. What was the first experience with the wild animal that kind of caused you to just become obsessed with this whole, you know, field of photography? Yes. Yeah. So, um, so I, I was 12 years old. I think, uh, my family planned the next no, I was 11 years old. Sorry. Mm -hmm. My family planned um, the next summer that we were going to go to Yellowstone. So I was oh, like, yeah. oh, that's awesome. I love the outdoors. I love animals. Um, I decided to um, ask for a uh, camera mm -hmm. that Christmas before we go to Yellowstone the following summer. So um, my parents got me one. It was like a little Canon power shot where yeah. you like you hold down a button and it zooms <laughs> all the way out. Yeah. So um I was so excited. I um, started taking pictures at our uh, local wildlife refuge down here uh, mm -hmm. that winter and just was so excited for the summer. That summer went to Yellowstone and just fell in love with wildlife photography and animals and capturing the moment. It's just, mm -hmm. I, I'm happy that uh, it's panned out the way it did. Yeah. Yellowstone is amazing, dude. I'm just it is. in that place. Did you see any bears on your first trip by any chance? I did. I did. Um, I saw a lot of bears, actually. <laughs> Um, it was pretty, pretty amazing. I think those were the first bears I've ever seen. Yeah. So it's just kind of like an awe dropping experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, so I went, fun story, side story. I went to Yellowstone. I think I've been like five or six times now. And for the first four times I saw zero bears and I went that like, during bear series season. I saw one bear on the side of the road, a black bear, a quick drive by it. That was the only bear I'd ever seen in Yellowstone. And we're, I'm talking like repeatedly going, looking for wildlife with yes. zero bears and then I went last spring in May. We're almost coming up on a year now, like May 13th. And I saw nine bears in one day, like three That's grizzlies, crazy. like black bears with cubs. But yeah, it's funny because people say, oh, on my first trip, I saw like two grizzlies and a black bear. And I went like five times without seeing a single bear. Um, but like, that, you know, with all this yeah. wildlife that you have, especially that you have available to you, like, you know, on the West Coast, what like draws you to owls specifically? Because I love photographing owls as well. And I think it's a pretty common theme in wildlife photography. I think people like owls a lot, but what like what drew you to them specifically? Yeah. So um 2020, I was still doing wildlife photography. Um, I I'd taken photos of not a lot of owls, but some and I loved it. Um mm -hmm. I decided to go up uh 
do a trip up to Seattle and take uh, pictures of barred owls and meet up with Izzy Edwards. Mm -hmm. She's another great young wildlife photographer. Um, And on the way back, decided to hit up um, northeastern Oregon, look for burrowing owls, um, and volunteered on a project. And as soon, the first day I volunteered, I got to hold a baby burrowing owl. And it was just like, this is what I want to dedicate my life to. And this is what I want to capture and share. Because mm-hmm. the they're just owls are amazing to me, and I hope yeah. other people agree and see that. So you know, it just kind of created my destiny. Yeah, no, I feel you. And like, so basically, it was like really the burrowing owls that you got, like, got you into it fully, right? Yeah, yeah. And then I became obsessed. Yeah, and um, oh, that's just awesome, man. I I've seen I saw some burrowing owls in South Dakota this past summer. I was out no. Two summers ago, I saw one like a hundred yards away out on the plains there. And that's the only burrowing owl I've ever seen. So I'm going to have to fix that someday. But yeah, when yeah. looking for owls, like when photographing owls, I think a lot of people, especially like normal people or people that want to just get into wildlife photography and they really love owls, but they don't know how to go about locating them. What's your like favorite tactic and like favorite strategies to go around? Because they're really hard subjects to find. A lot of them are nocturnal or they're crepuscular you know, and they have really good camouflage and they're just really difficult, you know, to find. So what's your favorite tactic or tactics in general to to kind of locate them? Yeah. So every owl is very specific, um, different habitats, you know, you know, different times of day Mm -hmm. they hunt. Um, and it's just kind of researching first of all. Yeah. And then most of it's just spending time out in the field. Mm -hmm. Um, and you have days or weeks where you don't see an owl, but all of a sudden, yeah. if you spend the time out in the field, you'll finally get a you know a counter. Um, mm-hmm. I, I will, depending on the species, I'll go out, listen at dawn and dusk. Mm-hmm. Um, usually they start you know, uh, calling from where they kind of roost, mm-hmm. and then I'll get to go back there later in the day and look for them roost. Um, yeah. Another tactic I use is eBird. E- eBird's great. Um, mm-hmm. They have range maps, uh, different calls. If you're not familiar with the species you're looking for, mm-hmm. and then all of a sudden they also have hot spots. Which yeah, do yeah. help out. Um, yeah, that's that's just about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's just time in the field and really knowing about them. One thing that I like to do is when I'm looking for them, like if you have like a pine tree or a really dense tree that you think an owl might be roosting in, I don't know if you do this, but I heard this on a talk from somebody. I don't remember who it was, but it was an owl talk that someone gave. And I heard that when I was like 14 or 13. And I've used this tactic to find like 90% of my owls where I'll put the tree between me and the sun or like me and the sky. Yep. And the light just, I don't know if you do this, but the light just goes yeah. through the tree and like the owls just stick out. Like they're so easy to see. Yeah, that. they're still wet. Mm-hmm. It's yeah, it's perfect. just like a big bee. Well, it's either an owl or a beehive or a porcupine, but there's a good chance it's an owl, you know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. but- when like you're photographing owls, you know, they have really difficult roosting. Well, no, not difficult roosting habits, but their roosting habits can be difficult for photography sometimes, you know? Yep. So how do you, like, what photographic techniques do you use while photographing owls, like specifically that you apply to owls? And then also like in a more generalistic sense with owls as well, but like wildlife in general, what photographic techniques do you apply to photographing your wildlife to make your images stand out, make them more creative and make them more unique? Because I remember you were mentioning that earlier. Yeah. I mean, um, obviously, I think the best time to photograph an owl is when it's active mm-hmm. because, you know, yeah. throughout the day they sleep and um, most of the time that's harsh light. Yeah. You're not going to get anything great, in my opinion. Um, yeah. You could get creative with it and get something, though. Yeah. But yeah. Um, spending the time out in the field when they're active Mm -hmm. and sometimes you're not going to get anything um especially if they're shy but uh you just got to spend the time out there in the field when they're active Mm -hmm. and uh yeah that's I think that's about what I do yeah 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 I got you and then just like really prioritizing that time when it's good light and then paying attention to you know like rule thirds and basic composition and stuff like that yep. do you ever find like I know you're mentioning wanting to go towards like looser compositions and things like that especially with the shorter focal lengths on the lens that you're working with um how do you go about doing that with owls because like a lot of time it's really really messy habitat and it doesn't work if sometimes I'm really tempted to just like close it in all the way to like 600 millimeters or 500 millimeters and just go for the blurry background you know um yeah. I mean the Pacific Northwest is like a beautiful area you know so 
that that makes it easier i'd imagine but yeah um i kind of now that i'm doing more envi environmental shots i've kind of putting less worry about uh messy compositions or backgrounds because yeah. that is the environment i mean if they're yeah. in a messy environment mm -hmm. so be it you know exactly um, whether it's like the owls in the cliff and the entire cliff is in focus and you have this yeah. little owl just sitting there um mm -hmm. i think that's just that adds to the the photograph so um it's it's hard um definitely because sometimes they don't stand out as much and the photo doesn't come out great but when it does mm -hmm. it it truly really, it, really it definitely stands out yeah, because you've got some shots of great horned owls nesting in cliffs specifically. You have one yep. that's like a nest, uh, not a nest shape, uh, a heart shaped nest cavity. That's just yeah. really cool. That's awesome. Um, yeah, it's like as you're saying, they are just really hard to photograph. They, it's hard for them to stand out. I've been shooting owls primarily since I started. I, it's kind of like what I got into because, I mean, out here is not as good as the West Coast for owls. It just isn't, but it's good. You know, it's one of the better places. We have like pretty good populations. Well, not population, but pretty good migrations of short-eared owls, pretty good snowy owls. We've got long-eared owls and um, uh, what's the little guys? The sawwood owls and things like that. Yep. Um, But, you know, it's just, it can be really hard to include that environment sometimes but sometimes that's kind of what you have to do to separate yourself from other photographers that are working with owls since there's just such a large amount of them you know but yeah. like you were mentioning you know you like do conservation work and um you know including the environment with your shot from a conservational standpoint do you like do you currently or do you plan on like using your images to like help conservation and like how do you go about or how would you go about like doing that yeah, um, I, I I spread a message about growing owls since that mm -hmm. those are kind of my niche yeah. um, right yeah. now. Um, and the problems they're facing with habitat loss and climate mm -hmm. change. Um, it's just it's ongoing, but they're very determined little owls. But um, I think ultimately it'd be great to um, maybe even become like an ambassador of short yeah. of sorts and mm -hmm. um, spread my message through throughout that way. Um. My large following that has happened definitely yep. helps me a lot. Yeah. I'm um, spreading my message and uh, I'm very grateful for that and the things that I can put out and um, educate people on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, that platform is just really, you know, it's that can help a lot. You know what I'm saying? Because I mean, people, people, I think, you know, people will put out reels and then other people will be like, oh, they're just doing it for followers and blah, blah, blah. But I feel mm -hmm. like if you have that platform, you can make serious change. I mean, you can obviously use it for harm. You can do it for bad things. But, you know, I mean, if you you can put out educational videos on like, say, why not to use rodenticide or something like that. And yep. that can reach hundreds of thousands of people, you know what I'm saying, with that platform. Now you're talking about like burrowing owls, something I want to dive in that you mentioned is like the issues that the challenges that burrowing owls are facing with climate change and habitat loss. Could you go a little bit more in depth on those? Yeah. So um as winters get harsher or mm -hmm. summers get harsher, yeah. Um it, it really messes up with their timeline. Um owls, you know, nest in a specific period or uh, mate in a specific period. And yeah. when it's too cold, sometimes the nest fails. When mm -hmm. it's too hot, sometimes the nest fails. And it's just, it's this delicate process mm -hmm. that uh, takes place for them. And with habitat loss, um, it's a huge thing with uh, more and more human interaction, I should say, uh, yeah. with habitat and more construction and just it's it's a huge problem especially in like florida and arizona yeah. i mean mm -hmm. you'll you'll have owls that are living in like somebody's front yard right mm -hmm. next to like a busy highway or something and um i think it's more we need to create safe places for them especially mm -hmm. for growing owls yeah i was just about to mention florida because i haven't been down there personally um but i'm hoping to go down to that area because like you know but also you hear about it and it's like you'll have a house and a house and then a burrowing owl family, yep. right? Have you been down there and photographed them down there? Or? I have not. I definitely. want to. You, Yes. Yeah, it sounds like we definitely both have to do that because it just, yeah. it sounds incredible to see them that close. But yeah, I mean, are there any other like issues like with the owl population that you were working with specifically? Were there any like niche problems that they were facing or? Yeah. yeah so, like, can you go a little more in depth with those? 
Yeah. Um, so the owls on in northeastern Oregon, um, it's this it's all on this um army depot where they used to house the world's like deadliest chemicals. So they, they have these bunkers where they used to house like Agent Orange and just like yeah. these nasty chemicals and different weapons and stuff. But since then that's all been gone. Um but with owls down there in the 60s, uh, the army reintroduced antelope onto the depot. Mm -hmm. um, and the depot, for reference, is a 20 square mile fenced in high fence barbed wire place. Yeah. Um, they reintroduced antelope onto the depot um, after 20 years or so after that, the antelope mm -hmm. got inbred and yeah. started to die off. Mm -hmm. So their solution and their thought process was that coyotes, local coyotes were doing it. Mm -hmm. So they started a mass killing, capturing killing spree of coyotes. Mm -hmm. And by bycatch, caught and killed all the badgers, which were yeah. the owl's number one um, way to have burrows and nest. Mm -hmm. and so once there's no badgers, there's no natural burrows. Um, for reference, natural burrows last usually a year to like tops maybe four yeah so you know after you, they kill all the badgers after four years burrows start collapsing there's mm -hmm. nowhere to nest less burrowing owls and then they decided to call up uh, my mentor dj mm -hmm. david johnson yeah um and we're like we have no burrowing owls and we don't know why yeah yeah so um we put in over the last 15 years have put in roughly 230 burrows across 92 sites, mm -hmm. um, two to three burrows per site. Yeah. And these just these artificial burrows for them to nest in. And our final project would be to reintroduce badgers. Mm -hmm. And that would be a permanent solution for these burrowing owls. Wow, that's incredible. I, I Two things. I was laughing a little bit because I just love how if anything is going wrong, with populations i love how everyone's first thing is just go to the predators they're like it's definitely oh, yeah. their fault it's always the apex predators right yep, yep man it's like oh there's no more elk it's definitely the mountain lions we got to get rid oh, yeah. of the mountain lions you know but it's also just crazy to think about how much everything is interconnected like that though i mean mm -hmm. you introduce pronghorn and they're like oh well you know they're dying off it must be the coyotes fault right and then you start getting rid of the coyotes accidentally get rid of the badgers and then somehow you went from getting rid of coyotes to no more burrowing owls and it's just like yeah. it's just that's insane now i know you love burrowing owls but i you've also worked a lot with great gray owls and you've gotten some really incredible shots of those guys so can you talk about some experience because i know great grays are a lot and a species that not a lot of people has access to have access to just you know just because of where they live you know they live kind of like in really the wild places so can you talk about like some of your experiences with them and photographing those guys yeah um great grays probably the species that i've spent the most time mm -hmm. uh, trying to find observing and photographing Lucky. um yeah that's awesome and they're they're very special um mm -hmm. a lot of them are very docile they're kind creatures big eyes you know big head they're yeah. the tallest owl in north america um and i have some locations that i go to they're just they're gorgeous mm -hmm. like just old growth forests and mountain meadows and it's yeah it's just so fun to be up there with them Mm -hmm. um they're magical creatures um i've had amazing experiences with them i mean last spring i came across one um in a meadow and yeah. it was raining pretty hard um i made my way over and he was hunting over a, a large patch of snow mm -hmm. and i think from what i could see it was it was a one or two year old um owl yeah so juvenile mm -hmm from how long they can actually live but um made my way over and just let me let me cross the meadow carefully watched yeah. me kept hunting mm -hmm. um and just as i got there the clouds kind of parted there's sun that came through sort of backlit the owl and backlit all this rain yeah. and he just kept hunting and i got to watch there and this magical scene just unfolded right be you know before my eyes and i spent i think I want to say the next like two or three hours just watching him hunt throughout this meadow he caught like two or three voles um and 
it's just something that'll stick with you. It's great grades, especially uh, mm -hmm. for the rest of your life. Yeah, man, that's just an incredible story. I remember that shot too, because that that shot, it was incredible. And I think that one got you a good amount of followers specifically oh, yeah. before, prior to the burrowing owl eruption, you know? Yeah. Oh, yeah. But man, I mean, they will really stick with you. I, I was photographing one in Minnesota and I don't have as much experience as you or like someone out in that area, like Elliot, you know, for example, or something. Mm. But I was photographing a great gray in Minnesota when I was driving out to Montana for school last year. And it was sunrise. And this thing, he he must have heard a vole right next to me. And I didn't get any flight shots because I was on manual focus because the D500 like cannot focus backlit. I don't know what his issue is. It just cannot. Yeah. It. Maybe it was the Sigma. Maybe it was the D500. Maybe it was a mix of the two. But it was struggling. And I was shooting right into the sun because the sun had just came up and it was like forest fire smoke, really beautiful light. And I got a shot that I really liked, you know, like it had the sun right behind his head. But he must have heard like a vole or something right next to my head. So he flies right at me, banks over my head, like wings spread over me and then crashes in the grass eight feet from me. And I'm just like, what? You know, because yeah. I mean, with other owls, that just doesn't happen that much. You know, I've had some. No, no it doesn't. Chill. But no, like, they're very they just see you as another creature going about your business. So they'll go about their business. It's so cool. I just oh, they're incredible. Now, you know, looking at like great grays and stuff and your work that you've done, not like photographic work, but, you know, your scientific work that you've done with burrowing owls. Do you see yourself working with other species of owls in the future? And if you were to, like, what species would you go for? Yeah. Um. So ultimately, someday I want to have my own nonprofit dedicated yeah. to owl conservation and the science of owls. Um. I'm not sure yet. I know that there hasn't been a lot of work done with whiskered screech owls actually. Mm -hmm. And yeah. they're, um, they're a Southern species yeah. uh, down in Arizona and New Mexico and throughout Mexico. Um, that's something that I'm thinking about doing possibly for a uh, graduate program, but we'll see where that goes. Sounds challenging, but it sounds fun too. Yeah. Have you seen one? I, I I didn't catch this. Did you see, have you seen one before or? No, but um, I think, I think this summer I'll be able to, uh, I think I'm going to do an internship down in the Chiricahua Mountains, which is south um, east Arizona. It's kind of mm -hmm. like their sky islands. So they, it's all this flat area and then they have these big mountain groups, which they yeah. call islands. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll be able to work with some owls down there. Six, six species, um, whiskered screech owl, Western screech owl, elf owl, uh, sawet owl, flamulated owl, and I think is that five or six? That I was a counter, yeah. but I think yeah, yeah. So all the but, little um, guys, basically. Yeah, all the little guys. <laughs> yeah. So I'll get to work with them. I'm very excited about that, and I'm sure I'll fall in love with them like I do every mm -hmm. other species. Yeah, yeah, man. Owls just have a way of doing that, like. You just, you can just skip, you can like, you, like you see a photo of an owl. For me, my story of this is like, I didn't love pygmy owls. I had never mm -hmm. seen one, but I didn't love them. I don't know. I just didn't like how they looked, whatever. I like, they weren't my favorite. I know that's a bad thing to say, but we were in Yellowstone. I was in Yellowstone with my mom in like 2019. We're driving on this pass and I see what I think is a bohemian waxwing flying over my head. This tiny little bird flying. And I'm watching. I'm like, oh, that's cool. And then it lands and I swear it was a waxwing and then it just shape shifted to an owl when it sat down yeah. on that on that tree and I'm like wait because someone told us that there was an owl a pygmy in that area and I freaked out I'm like wait that's a pygmy owl right so we pull over and it was so cute I mean they're just adorable oh, yeah they oh, little, little like tennis balls with like you know a tail mm -hmm. and they're so small too because that's I mean saw what owls are small like they're small yeah I've seen two saw what owls I've still found in the wild but I feel like the 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 pygmy was like another level of tiny I mean yeah. it flew like it was just like a a, a waxwing or a, a, you know a townsend solitaire or something like that what's your experience with like pygmy owls have you ever done like expensive photographic work with them or that's that's a tough question because i've spent so much time out in the field looking for one mm -hmm. and i've yet to find one you've so never seen is, one yeah i've never seen one what how do yeah. i live in boston that i've seen one before you did <laughs> i have no idea but i've this is the year i'm gonna dedicate this year to finding my first pygmy owl you got this um, it just it blows my mind that I haven't seen one because mm -hmm. of how much time I've spent out looking for them. Yeah. But um, 
still confident. Don't let it, you know. No, you got this. Yeah. I know, I know someone from my area who went out to Oregon for a trip. I don't even know if it was a birding trip. And then he just like stumbled upon one. Yeah, that's how it happens. It, <laughs> yeah. I, I get so jealous because there's just like there's people that like aren't even birders mm-hmm. and they'll go out, they'll see an owl and they're like take a picture and post it on like Facebook. They're like, what kind of owl is this? Yeah. Like, or <laughs> lucky bastard <laughs> no i know dude it's always the non-birders like i swear they'll just post on instagram with a cell phone photo it's like grainy and then it's like a long-eared owl sitting on a sign right in front of them and they're like oh i came across this little guy or and then sometimes they'll say it's an owl and it's like a cooper's hawk or something like that it's just oh, like, yeah. you know, there's always some of that but yeah you know i just owls really do have a way of just drawing people in um this is a curveball question i did not i I sent matt some of the questions before this podcast i did not send him this one uh because i want to throw it at him if you had to pick right now like you had to pick right now i think you already know what the question is going to be what's your favorite owl at the moment i know i know the answer you want to say is all of them because i would say the same thing in your position but if you had to pick one at the moment it's it's a close call between great grays and burrowing owls um mm-hmm. i love the way great grays look i think yeah they're probably the most beautiful owl maybe in front of boreal owls i really enjoy boreal owls but um it's got to be burrowing owls they're, they're mm-hmm. just the, they're the owl that started it all for me and yeah. started this path for me and you know this life goal for me so that they really have a special uh, place in my heart yeah, that's understandable. I mean, if you're working with, like, holding them, literally holding them and putting yeah. them, I, I could imagine it'd be hard for those not to be your favorite. And also, I'm not, we're not recording a video version of this, but behind Matt, there's a print of a burrowing owl behind him. I, I'm right. Yep. Yeah, with the moon one. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. They're, they're beautiful owls. I just need to get more experience with those guys. Um, oh, now, with I can owls, help you out with that. What? What? I can help you out with that. We oh, can really? That, that sounds awesome. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that, that would be great. Now, um, another thing about owl photography, and one thing I want to do with this podcast is discuss ethics a lot. And because I think ethics is, I think how it's approached isn't always the best, but I think there's just like, it's not really discussed because it's so controversial and people just avoid it. Now, I want to have like episodes completely dedicated to specific ethical topics and things like that. But when you're photographing owls and you're working with owls a lot, obviously owls are kind of like at the epicenter of ethical photography it's kind of like the big hot spot of because because there's I mean my understanding of it is there's so much just people love owls so much and I don't I mean I I love them too I can't give like an objective answer to why that is some people say the front facing eyes that look like make it look like a human or whatever but so many people there's so much pressure on these birds that a lot of the ethical issues that apply to all wildlife are really like concentrated on owls Mm -hmm. so when it comes to like you photographing owls, like what are some kind of like ethical rule sets you try to follow? Um, how do you feel about like location sharing and playback and things like that on owls? Just like your general ethical thoughts on that. Yeah, um, I think owls in particular are very sensitive and delicate species. Mm-hmm. So it's it's definitely um, a good thing that we're talking about this and people, there is a conversation about it, you know? Yeah. Um, whether or not people get really angry or not. Um, (laughs) but, uh, I think besides like from a scientific standpoint, um, just mainly from a photography standpoint, baiting, live baiting with, um, prey is, should be frowned upon. Mm -hmm. Um, and especially, uh, well that and, um, playback calling should be frowned upon. I think in, almost all situations um there's some where i can see it happening with like scientific uh mm-hmm. you know reasons but um they're so balanced based on their energy mm-hmm. and energy is key to them keeping the perfect weight like this is with almost all animals yeah. keeping the perfect weight to go about and live another day live mm-hmm. another week um it's all just energy based so when you're taking time away from an owl whether you're um baiting them with like playback calls Mm -hmm. that you know two or three hours where they're riled up or an hour Mm -hmm. that's where they could be sleeping saving their energy or that's where they could actually 
be going out and getting prey. Yeah. You know, especially if there's a nest where they need to be feeding young, uh, young kids. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm not going to say like, I'm not going to lie to everyone and say that I've never done some, I haven't done mistakes. Um, when I first got into owls before all my growing owl experience, I was the guy that was like, you know, playback. And I just, I didn't, I was uneducated. So Mm -hmm. I'm not going to be the guy that the moral police, but I think being educated, uh, definitely helps you especially with you know any kind of species um any kind of animal um being educated about what you're photographing will ultimately help the animal yeah um, succeed and you know live another day live another day exactly yeah i think you know here's my thing is it's like i feel like a lot of people will get up on like a soapbox and they will just talk about how how important it is to be ethical, which it is, it's very important, but they act like they've never made mistakes, which I think is something I want to avoid doing. Um, Cause like, I don't want to, cause I want to really talk about a lot of topics and, you know, there's a lot of topics like baiting and playback and stuff like that, that can't really be explored in like a part of a podcast discussion. They, I think a lot of them need to be explored in full blown episodes. So we can't dive into all those in their fullest extent, but like, you know, I agree with you on pretty much everything you just said, you know, but it's like a lot of people will just I mean, they act like they don't make mistakes. And then, because I've made mistakes in the past and I'm going to have to be very open about that because since I want to discuss it so much, I can't not talk about those mistakes. You know what I'm saying? Um, But I think as a culture, we need to be more open to just like discussing it and not shutting down conversation on it because it is very important because we're photographing wildlife and we should make sure we're not harming the wildlife when we're photographing it. I just think it needs to be approached from a much more objective standpoint. I think the way you worded all of that was very well done because I think a lot of people will get on there and I understand where they're coming from. You know, but a lot of people will get on and just start talking about how, oh, like these terrible, horrible people that do these things to the owls. And like you said, a lot of the times they're just, they don't know, right? Like, yeah, I mean, I've, I've been that person that, you yeah. know, um, shouts out at someone that's doing something wrong. And, mm-hmm. you know, now that I look back at it, it's just, they don't know. And there's no yeah. reason to get, so upset about it and it's just it's more about educating them about you know the correct ethics exactly and like even if they might know part of it you know it's like i feel like the community is so heated up it's so heated that like they don't want to really think about it because they don't want to be associated with the unethical group you know putting that in air quotes so if you call them out for something they're more likely to just deny it because they don't want to face that uh how do i say this they don't want to identify with the unethical group because of how they feel yeah. about the unethical group. So I think how we just discuss the whole thing needs to be, you know, um, you know, reapproached. But I think the way you worded that is very well done. And I agree with you on pretty much everything. One other thing I want to touch on with owls specifically is like location sharing and like, because yeah. I know that's a big thing with owls, especially like roosting owls, so like long-eared owl roosts, you know, that's a big thing. Um, so like, how do you approach like sharing location with somebody? Uh, how do you feel about like public location sharing on like eBird and like, you know, things of that nature? Yeah, I think um, keep them, keeping them quiet is the best way to go about it. Mm-hmm. Um, I I share with close friends, people that I trust, mm-hmm. um, not large groups. Um, and like eBird um, and like I naturalist, um, I don't really agree with specific locations or exact locations, mm-hmm. um, but like general locations, just yeah. where people can go out and find it themselves mm-hmm. um, is the best way to go about it. And it, I mean, that's the most rewarding way, right? Exactly. I agree. Um, yeah. But I think it's definitely something that should be handled um, quietly and delicately uh, mm-hmm. for the owl's sake. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's just a very important topic, but also, you know, it's kind of important to me because the thing is when I started out, I started out when I was like 11 or 12 and there was all these very, very kind people that shared locations with me, you know, of certain owls and, you know, they helped me get started. You know what I'm saying? And, you know, when you were saying that you've used playback and the stuff and stuff in the past, um, I I was never a playback user, but I was a major, like, massive location sharer. Like, if I found okay. long-eared owl roosting, because I was very good. Like, a lot of people in my area consider me to be, like, the owl kid. Like, I'm just very good at finding them roosting and stuff. 
And, you know, I, if I found a long eared owl, which I did a couple of times, I would tell when I was younger, I, I didn't know, but I would tell everybody I could think of because I wanted to make them happy. But also, I mean, it's because there's also like, you know, there's the individual owls and how they act. And, you know, sometimes some owls are super chill, while other times they really, you can't even get 100 yards from them without them freaking out. And then there's like different species and how they behave. Like there was an eastern screech owl here a couple of years ago, and it, I haven't seen it for years, but it was in a city park. And this thing had like kids playing basketball right in front of it all day. And like it, this thing did not care. It would not, you could like throw a rock at it and it wouldn't even look at you, you know. But yeah. then I've seen like snowy owls that fly by, like, I, I watched a snowy owl get flushed by a snow bunting and then fly on the beach and get flushed by a dog. And it was so riled up. If anyone was walking on the beach within 100 yards, it would fly, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So yep. it's just like, you know, location sharing. And once again, I, I don't, it, these are tough topics to dive into on a podcast episode because they're so tough, you know, because I don't like it's hard to say, OK, how much location sharing is is good or bad and how many people can you share it with? Um, and then also uh, also the whole thing about like the gatekeeping of locations and people say like, well, who has a right to see the bird? It's just all very difficult to dive into. And that's why I want to like dive into it, because I think it's just discussions that need to happen um, on your point about eBird and things like that. I think eBird and iNaturalist, it, I think it's very lo location, like area specific, you know, because out where I am, and I, I'd assume where you are, or like somewhere in the Great Lakes region with a high, like really high amount of birders and wildlife photographers. Um, if you share, like if I were to share a long-eared owl on eBird, that thing would blow up the next day, right? It would go insane. And I'd imagine like if you shared like a great gray location, it would blow up, you know, whatever. But I was in Montana for school, right? And I was an hour and a half from Yellowstone. And I remember a solid owl got reported at my main shooting spot, which was a 20 minute walk from campus. Now, somehow I didn't see it. I went there almost every day and didn't see it, you know? But it's funny because I went there the day after it was reported or like like the day it showed up on the reports, not a single bird or photographer in there. No, because I, I didn't feel like the, I don't, I mean, it was like the Bozeman area. And yeah, there's like a lot of wildlife photographers in that area, but like, I feel like they're all very mammal oriented, you know? And I feel like if you were in like, let's say the middle of nowhere, Idaho, and you post something on eBird, you know, it's kind of like, I, I guess I've had some like moral consideration about like, okay, I wouldn't post a location on eBird, but is it moral for me to go to a location that was posted on eBird? How do you feel about like that? That is very tough because it's it like, is. if somebody posts an exact location of say like a pygmy owl nest or something, it's mm -hmm. like. I want to go. Yeah. And I think ultimately I am going to go, but it'd be best for, I don't know. It's such a touchy topic, right? It's tough. It is. Yeah. Because I don't know. I, I don't know if it's the ethics that go on to it. Um, I think it comes down to the person who finds the owl mm -hmm. and it's going to be their decision you know, whether they post an exact location or whether they even post a location at all. Yeah. Um, and it comes down to each person trying to, that finds owls to make a change, I think, mm -hmm. in that, in that regard. Um, it's, I don't know, that's a tough question. Uh, it, I think about it a lot. I mean, one thing, I, a problem I have with like posting a sensitive species of any kind on eBird or iNaturalist is when you post that, and it's different for private sharing, even like a larger group that you private share to, that's still different. But if you post on eBird, like you can have a moral logical rule set that you follow. But the problem is if you post that publicly, you don't, you can't control who has access to that. So like, let's say you are someone who's like conventionally ethical, you don't use playback, you don't bait, whatever, you make mistakes, but then you put it out on eBird and some guy named like Mike, who has always has like five mice in his pocket and a giant Bluetooth yeah. speaker, you know, gets a hold of that location. And it's like, okay, well, you know, you're kind of opening it up to that. And so I usually recommend people not to post very sensitive stuff on like eBird, you know, like if it's obviously like a warbler species or something, it's different, you know, but if it's yeah. a sensitive bird, owls included, I usually advise not to post that. But then the issue is, as you said, like if in my area of solid owl nest got published on eBird I would really want to go you know what I'm saying yeah right but it feels hypocritical for me to say don't go 
I mean, don't mm. post them, but if you post them, I'm going to go. Like, do you understand? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, I totally, that's, that's, you know, <laughs> the hard part of that question. Um, yeah. And I, I think it does come down to the person that posts it. Mm -hmm. um, it should be their responsibility. Yeah. Uh, because they should understand that there are consequences if a whole bunch of people show up. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so I, yeah. I, I never used eBird. Um, more <laughs> not from a ethic standpoint but just more because i don't have time Same. um yeah. I, i'm just kind of enjoying out in the field i don't really want to be on my phone so yeah no i'll always look it up i mean i always scroll through ebird i used to be just like an owl kid specifically that's all i used to care about like in mammals and things but now i'll scroll through and i'll look for specific warblers or shorebirds and owls and things like that but i never post on it i've just never gotten around to it but i guess also with like the publishing on ebird a big part of it is as i was mentioning like like if you're in the middle of Idaho, I think the ethics of posting a location would be different than if you're in like Connecticut, you know what I'm saying? Like near a big city, because you could post the same species. Like let's say you post a long-eared owl, right? One in Idaho. I think they have long ears in Idaho. I'm pretty sure I could be yeah. wrong. You do? Okay, awesome. They're across the U.S. Okay, awesome. So you post a long-eared in Idaho and then you post a long-eared in Connecticut. If you're in the middle of nowhere, Idaho, and the closest town has a population of like 300 people, you know? there's a good chance nobody's going to go to that spot. I mean, you could maybe have someone fly out, but that's probably not going to happen. Whereas if you post on Connecticut, there could be 50 photographers there in an hour. So oh, yeah. I think it's hard to put blanket statements over it because it's just like, as it, it just, it changes so much. And I really do think what you're saying, it, like it is up to the individual posting it to judge like whether this is an appropriate location to post on ebird or iNaturalist but when it gets into private sharing I don't even want to dive into that because that that deserves an entire yeah. podcast episode on yes it does it's so like how many people to share it with how much do you need to trust them things like that you know yeah um yeah but I think that was yeah I just think it's really important to kind of discuss that you know because it is an important topic ethics in a general more general sense um yeah but I think that is everything I have for questions. Are there any final thoughts you want to throw in there? Everybody go out and look for owls. Exactly. It'll change your life. That is the best philosophy for life ever. Just go look yep. for more owls. I, um, I'm i excited. This I don't know how it was for you, but this owl season for me was pretty bad. For I, winter sucks. <laughs> Every year it's like winter is such a drag and there's nothing mm -hmm. going on. Yeah. And finally spring hits and then there's baby owls start popping up and it's just like, finally, finally. Yeah. I, you know, usually I'll see like six, five to seven snowy owls a year and I'll see each of them multiple times in my area. Uh, my area is pretty good for snowy owls, but like this year, I think I saw, I had three sightings total. I had one on Thanksgiving day. I had one the day after Thanksgiving. And then I had one about a quarter mile away in a marsh in like December. And that was it. I didn't see one short-eared. I missed the short-eared a bunch of times. Um, there was a short-eared at my main spot recently in the last couple of weeks. It was there. And I went after the short-eared because like, I haven't seen one all week. But then I should have gone after the plovers because they came back. And then the light was incredible and the short-eared didn't pop out. And I know I'm pretty sure you know that feeling. You know, it's like... Yeah. Oh, yeah. Definitely. Yeah. yeah but, I um, think um, snowy owls are due for a... They're overdue for an eruption year. So... Yeah. Yeah, maybe this next Cross year. Our fingers, hopefully this uh, upcoming winter. Oh, man, yeah, you guys don't really get them. I mean, outside of eruption years, right? Yeah, we. I mean, yeah, I think Southern Oregon, Northern California is kind of the lowest they go in eruption years. Yeah, but if it's not an eruption year, man, that, no I, you guys have us beat in every other field. I mean, you've got the great grays, you have the boreals, you have all that oh, yeah. stuff, but we do think, have the snowies. 17 out of the 19 uh, North American species are in the Pacific North That's Northwest. Insane. What? Oh, wait. Oh, are the ones you're missing, are those just like the Southern like screech owls and like elf owls and stuff? Or? Yep. Alpha, elf owls. Um, maybe it's 16 out of the 19 species. I guess. Uh, Whiskered screech owl, Eastern screech owl and elf owl, I think. Mm -hmm. That's just think. insane. That's, yeah. that's ridiculous. Yeah. Well, that was a good discussion. I enjoyed that. Yeah, awesome. yeah I enjoyed it too. It was Happy to be on here. That, I was kind of nervous for the first episode, but it, it was a lot smoother than I uh, than I expected. That was awesome. Well, thank you very much for coming on. Um, Where do you hang out 
most on social media? If anyone listening to this wants to find you, like where do you hang out the most? And like, what are your usernames on that and stuff? Yep. Uh, Instagram, mm-hmm. uh, TikTok, everything's just Matt Pool Photo. Uh, and how do you spell that? Like, how would you spell that? Yep. And what's that? How would you spell that out? Like for anyone looking at M A T T P O O L E photo. There we go. Awesome. And then um, also have a website, which is mattpoolphoto.com. So awesome. you can check out some of my work there. Yeah. And your website's really good. It looks really nice. I've checked it out a thank couple of times. <laughs> well, thank you very much for coming on. I enjoyed that a lot. Um, but yeah. Thank you. Hey, everyone, and thank you for listening to this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. I had a lot of fun recording that. Uh, Matt is awesome. Make sure to follow him on social media. Check out his work. It's fantastic. And if you like this episode, a lot of the podcast is going to be like this. So if you're not already, make sure to subscribe on YouTube, follow on Spotify, turn on notifications, things like that. Um, I'll keep you guys updated on future episodes. But yeah, until then, uh, keep going outdoors, keep shooting, and I'll see you next time.